Welcome boys and girls, hope you're doing well in these uh, corona times. We'll be stripping down this 1962 Longin flagship today. And while Longin nowadays is a sort of entry-level uh, luxury watch in the Swatch Group, back in the 60s they were really at the top of their game and were seen as one of the leading watch manufacturers, really competing with the, the likes of IWC, Omega, Rolex and so forth. Uh, the flagship was one of the top models together with the Conquest. And of course, uh, they also had the Ultra Crown, which was quite groundbreaking. Before we start the strip down, let's uh, make sure everything works as it should or not. That will tell us a lot. I'm also going to look at the time grapher, and we see the watch definitely needs a service, but it looks quite okay, to be honest. And after taking off the lovely enameled case back, we see the fabulous Longines 341 movement. Over engineered? Yes, absolutely but a fantastic movement. It has the off-center ball bearing uh, rotor that runs along the edge of the case. The bezel was really stuck, so uh, we had to use this special press and quite a lot of gunk coming out there as well. Same thing with the crystal, very difficult to get off. It must have been probably a couple of decades worth of DNA and gunk in there. Hey, move your hands, buddy. I'm trying to tell people about this gunk here. Thank you. Here we can really see the off-center position of the rotor. The rotor is also ball bearing based, uh, with five uh, rubies uh, rolling inside. And finally, we have the movement completely out. We're also going to release the spacer from uh, the case itself. And calling it a spacer might not actually do it justice, because it also holds the whole movement in place, uh, including the rotor. And then we can finally also take the hands off. And of course, we need to be very careful with the dial. And finally, take the dial itself off. Now what we see a lot of the time when we start working on vintage watches is that they have uh, crystals that have followed the watch for much longer than it should. So what you think is uh, maybe a bad dial very often is actually very nice underneath a very scratched crystal. We're checking to see if everything works as it should and also to understand how the different wheels work together to change state and so forth. It's very important to have an understanding of what you're doing instead of just starting to unscrew everything. Taking a watch apart is not what's difficult. Any person with a couple of screwdrivers and a semi-steady hand or not can do that. It's actually putting it together again that's the real challenge. And using glue and duct tape is not really considered best practice. So what we want to do now is just take enough parts off to be able to take the cannon pinion off. We want to still keep the keyless works in place, we're just removing some of the calendar parts. And then we can turn the watch over and continue on the train side. Now taking the automatic works off while the watch is in the case is actually often a good idea. We could have done that here as well. And there we see the special rotor. It runs in this track along the edge. We're just going to take off the automatic module here. Actually, not even the whole module, just uh, one wheel basically to break the, the chain of wheels in the automatic uh, works. That way we can access the click and let the power down from the mainspring.
Next we're gonna take the balance off. And the balance is of course the most delicate part of a watch. So we want to be very careful with it. Best thing is perhaps to have a special compartment for it in your tray or uh, even a special little box for it. But turning it upside down, laying it down in the tray is, uh, is a good way to do it. After taking the pallet fork off, we can see how freely the Tron reigns. Did I say Tron reigns? Okay, delete this. Note to self, delete that part of the video. So if we turn the wheels a little bit from the barrel, or you can also use the crown to see how uh, freely the, the train runs. Yes, nailed it. Then we can take off the barrel bridge. Now, as we will see, this uh, movement also has a quite special design when it comes to the barrel arbor uh, and the barrel. The barrel arbor is actually on this wheel that you see here. And the barrel itself is a sealed unit. Now, if you're thinking sealed unit, schmealed unit, no one tells me what to do apart from my wife, then you can of course open the barrel and change the spring. In this case we want to see if we can just reuse it, see if we can still get uh, acceptable uh, performance out of the watch. As we take off the train bridge we see that there's a lot of wheels underneath and it's also interesting that there's only one bridge for the train. It's not your typical Lapin style uh, movement. So that one train bridge also has to cover all the different wheel heights. Another unusual feature is that the center wheel is actually riveted to a small bridge by itself. See, we have to take that off from the dial side. So we turn the movement over again and start taking off the rest of the calendar works. And yet another unusual feature. We just talked about the single train bridge on the train side. There's actually a train bridge on the dial side as well and that is very unusual. In order to make sure that the wheels are planted as straight as possible, you typically have uh, the wheels planted onto the main plate itself and not between two bridges like this. But it does work, so uh, well done Longin. Now we can take off uh, the last piece of the automatic works. And then we can take off the center wheel bridge. You can see these two big screws there are actually for the center wheel bridge. And it is nice to have big screws. We will shortly do a video on an Omega 1000 series where we'll do a lot of cursing over the size of the screws. And another quirky but really beautiful way of operating your crown is uh, this rocker. Switching between the time setting and the winding. Honestly, it doesn't really achieve that much. You can perhaps argue that it makes uh, the watch movement a little bit thinner, but that's not really the case either. But it's a beautiful uh, way to do it. Rockers were the way they did it in the olden days, before the Swiss, I think it was Le Coulter, came up with a sliding pinion system, which is basically always used today. But it's a very elegant way of doing it. Taking off the keyless works. And opening the shock setting, taking out the balance end stones. And basically preparing everything for cleaning. And then the uh, center wheel bridge came off as well. And pretty much the last piece on the train side is taking off the setting lever spring. And yes, it is on the train side, just under the barrel. So up is down and down is up with this movement. But it really is a beautiful piece of mechanics. As well as being a very high performance movement. Perhaps the very best launch ever made. I guess the 430 will also be in contention for that. 
Last thing we want to do is put the balance back on to get ready for the cleaning machine. We'll open the shock setting and take the install out on this side as well. It's funny, the shock settings are indeed different on the different sides of the main plate. And voila! All right, time to put our legs up and let the cleaning machine pull its own weight. Just got the watch back from the cleaning machine. So the first thing we're gonna do now is uh, apply oil to the end stones in the shock setting. It might be easier and faster even to do this with an automatic oiler. And then of course you wouldn't have to take the shock settings out in the first place. But uh, yeah, depends on how you're uh, brought up, I suppose. I like doing it this way. It gives me full control of the amount of oil and that it comes in the right place. When the shock settings are empty, so there is no chaton or uh, no end stone uh, under the spring, then the spring is a little bit more difficult to open up. So instead of using uh, the tweezers, uh, I like to use an old broken oiler for that. Old oilers are very useful for a lot of things. The bigger sizes you can shape as a screwdriver to uh, use in hairspring collet adjustments. Smaller ones can be used for probing and for uh, getting uh, pivots into jewel holes, etc. And of course, real watchmakers use them as toothpicks, which can be very beneficial if your diet is uh, somewhat low on iron or steel. And we saw in the strip down that uh, the shock setting is actually different from the uh, dial side to the train side. Not sure why, but uh, that seems to be uh, common on this movement. But then again, there's a lot of uh, unusual stuff going on in this movement. It's clear there were fewer constraints on the development budget back in those days and also manufacturing. Because there's a lot of over-engineering as we discussed a little bit in the strip down. And we'll have a little bit more time to discuss that in this video. And before moving on, we want to make sure that the balance swings as freely as possible. It's a good idea and good habit to check that uh, the oil bubble is in the center of the end stone that hasn't floated out to the sides and so forth. And with a high magnification eyeglass or microscope, you can see that there's sort of a donut of oil around the pivot. And if that donut is sort of contained within the diameter of the spring, then uh, you have uh, done a good job. And when we're confident the balance runs freely, that it's well oiled, let's put it back safely. And forming good habits is also very important when it comes to dust covers. Put the dust cover back on as uh, often and as soon as you can. Now let's start assembling the train bridge on the dial side. Now assembling a watch can also be done in a different sequence. Some people like to start with the keyless works. Some like to start with a train. You basically just want to make sure you're not doing a lot of back and forth. The thing with this movement is that given that you have two train bridges, one on each side, if we want to start with a train, then we have to first do the train bridge on the dial side. Then we can put in the barrel with this uh, special barrel arbor wheel. You might remember that the setting lever spring is actually underneath the barrel. So you can also put that in before you start putting in the barrel. I like to put in the train first just to see that everything runs well. In case I have to do more cleaning, etc. So uh, we'll put the uh, setting lever spring in back later. The center wheel is also a bit uh, odd, as you might remember. Uh, there's also this uh, little wheel that goes uh, underneath it for the automatic works. The thing is that we have to screw it in from underneath. But if we put too much pressure, especially on the screw close to the center wheel, then we're going to push the whole wheel out. 
So we have to be careful with that. And of course, we always want to double check that uh, the wheels run freely. Then we can start putting the rest of the train in. And it's quite funny as well that uh, the escape wheel is all the way at the edge of the plate. We'll get a close-up of that a little bit later as well. And as mentioned in the first video, the train bridge is a one piece. So not your typical uh, Lepin style uh, movement. It's very elegant, but it's also quite costly to uh, produce. And again, as always, we double check, triple check that everything runs freely before we start screwing things down. Good uh, habit is to hold it down with uh, some sort of a probe. Breaking pivots on these old movements is really bad. Getting replacement parts is not easy for these old movements. Now that we're happy that the train runs freely, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the barrel bridge and the barrel out again and then put the setting lever spring back in. Now let's talk a little bit more about the over-engineering part. One of the rumors or maybe stories about why Longin designed this movement the way they did with all these kinds of crazy uh, things going on is that they wanted to avoid pattern struggles with the turner. It doesn't really make a lot of sense for the rotor, yes, with the five ball bearings in it. Of course, Returnomatic used that as also their logo. But for the rest of the movement, uh, I'm not really sure. But it is a fabulous movement to work on and uh, certainly different. So we put the setting lever spring back in under the barrel, put the barrel back in, screw the barrel bridge down. We'll put a tiny drop of HP1300 or similar on the jeweled bearing for the barrel. And then we'll start looking at the keyless works. The coolest thing about the keyless works in 341 is of course the rocker. And the wheels are riveted to the rocker. So we put a little bit of oil there to make sure they run freely as well. And we secure a rocker with one screw. And actually the screw hole is not in the main plate. It's in a tube that is press fit into the main plate. And the tube also has a horizontal hole drilled through it for the stem to go into. And if that the tube is then not properly aligned, the stem will not go deep enough. And then you'll have a problem using the crown to set the time. Last thing we need to do now to make sure we can start using the crown is to then put on the uh, click and the click spring. And then we can check the free running of the train with the crown and also then start winding it to put on the rest of the escapement. And it's a pretty cool little thing that the click is again on the, let's say, wrong side of things. So on the dial side rather than the train side. All right, let's turn the watch over. We'll put in the winding pinion and the stem. And again, making sure everything runs freely. Now for the pallet fork, it's a very good idea to use fixer drop. That helps the oil or the grease stay on the pallet stones. There's just very little force in a mechanical watch. So if there's too much grease or oil on the pallet stones, that could uh, create enough uh, friction or drag to actually slow the watch down to uh, negatively impact the timekeeping. And the fixer drop helps keep the oil or the grease on the pallet stones. The pivots on the pallet fork are among the smallest ones in the watch. So we want to make very sure we don't tighten the screws before uh, they can really see that the pallet fork moves freely. 
And again, a strong eyeglass or a microscope is very useful here, especially until you've gained enough experience to see that the bridge falls into place with the pivots in the holes. Then we can put some power on with the crown and then see that the pallet fork flips nicely from side to side. Seems good. So let's tighten the screws properly. And then the moment of truth. Putting the balance in. And the most satisfying thing in a watchmaker's life. At least one that's not, let's say, married or has a girlfriend or boyfriend or significant other. Or some type of subscription or similar. Is to see the balance start running. Come to think of it, that sounds a bit depressing, actually. But that's the biggest uh, satisfaction. Anyway, enough of that, I think. Let's check on the timer, how the watch runs. And make sure we have the beat error corrected. And with a little bit tweaking, we uh, see we can get nice performance out of the watch. This is with the original barrel still in place. We did not change the mainspring. And when we put the automatic works on, we will get a bit higher amplitude as well. But we're happy to see uh, that nice straight line and zero bit error. The remainder of the automatic works is basically just the transfer wheel and the bridge itself. Good practice to hold it down with the probe while we tighten the screws. Now let's have a quick look at the escape wheel. We see that's right on the edge of the movement. And just a little bit further along the edge of the movement. We will see the automatic works. This is the wheel that picks up the rotor movement. What we want to make sure happens is that when this wheel is rotated in both directions, the winding wheel that meshes with the ratchet wheel only moves in one direction. Alright. That seems good. So let's then go back to the other side of the movement again. There's a lot of flipping back and forth between the sides with this movement, but that's just how it is. As we're getting ready to put on the calendar works and the time setting wheels, let's first put in a little drop of uh, HP 1300 or similar on the different posts. And the first thing we do is put the cannon pinion on as that one frequently needs to be pressed relatively hard down. So if there's already the minute wheel underneath it, then you might actually damage the teeth on that. So better to put the cannon pinion on first. And again, always good to spend a couple of seconds here and there to check that everything runs nicely. We don't want things to jam up and only find out after we assemble the whole watch. Hey, why is this clip here? Who's editing this anyway? Of course, the pivots were oiled before we did the timing. Anyway, let's continue with the calendar works. Put some HP 1300 or similar on the cannon pinion for the hour wheel. And then intermediate setting wheels. And finally the calendar or the date finger. Yeah, runs nicely. Again, the movement itself is in very good condition. There's no problem at all with this watch. There's no rust. It's just a little bit of dirt and some old oil. Or actually not oil. But there are no actual problems with the watch per se. That of course is also a testament to the quality of the movement. And Longin really made some fantastic movements back in the day. 30L is of course very well known. 
1268Z, 19AS, just a lot of fantastic uh, movements from Longin. We also put a little bit of oil on the jumper, just a tiny little bit to make sure we get that positive action when it really clicks over. And we see the semi-quick set of these old watches. The date finger is a little bit curved, so it sort of slides over the previous date and then catches the next one. All right, we're happy with that. Let's flip the movement over again, put in the barrel arbor screw, and then we can put on the rotor with a rotor plate on top of that. And we need to make sure that the rotor teeth along the rim there engage properly with the driving wheel for the automatic works. And since this is a ball bearing rotor, we're going to put some bit of V106 into the ball bearing. And then we flip it again. I feel like a burger chef working on this one. Flip, flip. Put the dial washer underneath the dial. And then we can start putting the dial on, screw the dial down, and put the hands on. Before we get there, we again want to make sure that the date has a positive action. That we get this nice click. And we do want to actually do this for every single date. Because on old watches like this, it might be that one of the teeth of the date disc is damaged and then all of a sudden the date will not change for that date. But that takes a little bit long to do, so we're just going to do that for a couple of dates here. And on the date watch, we do know that when the short hand points at midnight, then the date should change. So we're using that the other way around. We're turning the crown until the date just flips. And then we know that it's midnight. So we can put the hour hand to point at midnight then. And once we have the hour hand properly set, then of course it's just a matter of doing the same thing with the minute hand. And again, we want to test, test, test. Make sure the hour hand runs smoothly, that it's uh, parallel with the dial, that the date flips nicely at midnight. So we'll turn the hour hand 24 hours at least to make sure we're positive about this. And once we are, then it's time for the minute hand, which we basically do exactly the same thing for. Now the hand setting tool might leave a few marks on the hands. So we can use some Swiss blade though to take that off. And then we basically repeat the process with a minute hand. And of course, lastly, the second sand. Turn the hands through 24 hours. Make sure the hands are at midnight or very close when the date flips. The minimum standard requirement is that the date flips between 15 minutes to and 15 minutes after midnight. But we should be able to get it within five minutes. And it is actually one of the first things that a customer will check when either buying a watch or having a watch returned from service that the date flips at midnight. And if it's 15 minutes before or after, that will actually be a little bit of an issue. So let's stick to five. All right, that looks good. Let's now turn to something completely different. The case was uh, also quite dirty when we got it. You might remember seeing the DNA and the gunk coming off when we took the crystal off and the bezel. We're not going to restore the case. It's in a perfectly nice order. And for a vintage watch, it's better to have it a little bit worn and showing that it's actually not a new watch than having it restored to look like a new watch. That just looks wrong and also takes a lot of value away from the watch. But we can clean it. And for this, the best tool is uh, the simplest, the pegwood sticks. Now you can get these on eBay as uh, cuticle cleaners. So basically manicure uh, stuff for 99 cents, including shipping. 
So that's uh, not a bad price. Coincidentally, I always thought that when my wife bought me a manicure course for my birthday, I thought that was actually a gift for her. But hey, manicure uh, it is. Of course, as a happily married man, whenever uh, I think these things, then my wife says these three little words that's the fuel of every marriage. You're an idiot! Well, technically, I guess that's actually four words, but close enough. Now, with most of the gunk off the case and the bezel, let's start looking at the crystal as well. The original crystal was quite uh, scratched, so we're going to put a new one on. And this is the difference between an old crystal and a new one. And as mentioned before, an old crystal can really mask a very nice dial underneath. But you might not think it's nice because of that crystal. So conversely, a new crystal is probably the cheapest and best way to make a watch really look much better. All right, so we're casing the movement. And uh, there's also multiple ways to do this, of course. As I say, there are many ways to skin a cat. I'm not sure why I would want to skin a cat in the first place, but I guess there are ways of doing it. I mean, a skin is just too small for anything useful, right? I mean, I guess in these corona times you could potentially use it as a face mask. But then if you have an allergy, you're going to go achoo, 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 all the time. And yeah, so I think it's better to keep cats as pets instead of skinning them. But that's, you know, personal preference. So the last few things to do now before we can uh, start wearing the watch is to put the crystal back on, put the bezel back on, and then fine adjust the timing. For timing, we actually want the watch to run a little bit fast per day. About eight seconds fast when fully wound is the standard. And the reasoning is that as the mainspring winds down when the watch runs, it will start running a little bit slower with less power. And it's always better to be early for something than late for something. All right, with a new strap on the watch. It looks quite dashing on the wrist. I hope you liked this video. Please click like and subscribe to support the channel. We'll be back shortly. Until then. Ta-ta.